here for the last the last session of the day um, before our cocktail hour. Um, and I'm just happy to welcome everybody to the community engagement group um, meeting. I am going to put a link in the chat for anybody who wants to learn more about the community engagement group and potentially join. There's just a link that you can follow. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so the community engagement group was formed a couple of years ago out of one of these conferences where we just decided we wanted to keep conversations going. We had Sally's formatting users group, but what about some of the other issues that we're thinking about? Kind of like what we talked about at the panel today and some of these other conversations. So we started the community engagement group to talk about honestly whatever y'all want to talk about. Um, talking about the changing culture that we have in our workplaces, promoting professional development. Sometimes we have people come and they just have a question, like what's everybody doing about this sort of thing? Um, and so we'll just have an, an hour long chat about what everybody's doing. We have, uh, we did one talk recently about stress management for thesis reviewers because it does get pretty stressful at the end of each semester when you have the students sending the emails with the exclamation points about, you know, we got a deposit by today. Um, so how can we take care of ourselves while also, and so that we can take care of our students? We're gonna have some really fun topics coming up. Um, one involves names on the title page and names that students use and changes to names that students might want to make. How do we deal with that? How does that that work at different institutions? Um, anybody can suggest a topic for the community engagement group. Just shoot me an email and we'll get that straightened out um, and, and we'll get you all set up. You can come to us with a question or a full-on presentation. We are a, a laid-back group. We meet every other month. So the months that Sally's not meeting, those are the months we are meeting. So we'll be meeting in October, and I'll send out some more information about that really soon. Um, but if you have any questions or want to know any more information, you can reach out to me um, at wokner2 at illinois.edu. And without much further ado, we're going to get on to our flash talks. So basically, we have around seven flash talks, six or seven flash talks. Everybody has five minutes each, and I have a team of people here helping me. So Valerie is going to be monitoring the clock, and she'll let you know when you're getting close to time. Terry Green, I am not a cat, is going to be monitoring the chat so that um, we can have questions and she'll collect your questions for you. And then I'll be coordinating the screen for everybody. So I should have everybody's uh, um, PowerPoints with me right now. What the plan is, is that we'll go through all the flash talks and then at the very end, we will have all of our questions just so that we make sure we get through everyone's flash talk. Um, and so please continue to put your questions in there um, in the chat as you have them, and we're going to give it a go. So our first presenter is Elizabeth McDonald from the University of Memphis. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Well, hi, thank you very much for letting me do this. Um, and I want to just start by saying I'm a catalog librarian. And so I have a librarian's perspective, but also a catalogers perspective. Um, I don't know all the audience makeup. I will try to keep the jargon to a minimum, but we are going to go into some of the weeds and I apologize for the weeds up ahead. So what, what I'm talking about is switching new URLs for old and library catalog records. In our institution, we create and maintain bibliographic records in our library uh, integrated library system, library catalog for each of our electronic theses and dissertations. This continues the process that we actually um, did with our print theses and dissertations in the past. And originally, we had locally created platform that housed our ETDs. And in 2021, we migrated to be Press Digital Commons platform. And of course, the new URLs meant we had to update, or I had to update, all of the existing 
URLs that link to our old system. And there is a program that I discovered called Mark Edit. Mark Edit allows you to edit Mark Records, which is the input format for uh, bibliographic catalog system records. And I, it has a merge function, which I only just discovered, which allows you to transfer information from one Mark Record to another Mark Record. So I thought I would go about how I use that to get this new information into that ILS and then some of the issues I also had with OCLC, which is our vendor that um, where we create and distribute catalog records from. So um, what we did is, or what I did is we get um, the information from uh, the B press system, which comes to us, we can download um, information that goes into an Excel spreadsheet. And I use the Mark Edit program to create what I call a mini bibliographic record or a mini Mark record. And that's the first record you see up on the screen where I could include the ID number. Oh, and one of the things I meant to say is uh, we were very fortunate in that our original ETD system created an ID number for each um, ETD that was entered into it. And I was able to put that information when I created the MARC records globally to put that information into a field, the O2FAR on the MARC records, so it was there. And that allowed me to use that as a match point. When we migrated the information into the uh, digital commons, I included that um, record number into the metadata as an ID number in BPress. So once we loaded everything into BPress, we got a spreadsheet out, an Excel spreadsheet out from them. And I used the um, Mark Edit program to create um, the mini Mark record you see there, which has, as you can see, the number, which is 1375. And I included a title in case I needed an I readable match and the 856, which is what our link to the digital commons is. I then exported all of our ETD records out of our, C we use the Sierra Integrated Library System and um, as exported them in the MARC format. And what I'm showing you in the next um, little snippet is the information that came out uh, as two pieces of the information that came out with our MARC records, which is the 024, which has the same 1375 number in it and showing you the um, URL link to our old system. Um, and then what I did is I did some brief editing of massaging the records to change an indicator on the link, which is the four one you see in the 856 record. And I apologize to people who do not speak Mark Tag, but that change allowed me to be able to delete that old link from the bibliographic records once everything was done. I used the Mark Edit tool, which is the merge tool, which allows you to uh, sync up your records based on a number of different fe features, but one of them is a strict numeric one. So I was able to tell it, you know, only move things from record 1375 to record 1375 from our Sierra system. And once I had done that programming, you can see at the bottom of the screen where the MARC record then had two URLs, the old URL and the new URL, URL for the digital commons. Um, if you wanna change the screens now. And you can also use this program to add notes at a later, um, front, if you put them into your mini MARC, I did do that, but I didn't put that information up here. We th I then went through and deleted the old URL and did some more massaging and reloaded the records back into the Sierra system. And I'm showing you a screen snippet of the back end of what it looked like once everything was done in our Sierra system, which is the um, new 856, the new link that goes in there and the display that goes out that our students see that tell them it's a University of Memphis digital commons that changed from the old system and that it's an open access record. Um, now, we do put all of our ETD bibliographic records out onto OCLC. That is our vendor. And some of you may be more familiar that that is also what powers um, the first search system. If you've ever used first, first search in your uh, libraries or um, in your on your campuses, 
And so all of our first search records, our OCLC records also had all of the old URLs. I went through and did the same process and then discovered that OCLC would not allow me to upload the new information by batch or singly. I had a call into OCLC and a number of changes, you know, conversations, and the ultimate answer was no. Um, so I really started to do it manually, but didn't want to. We don't have near the number of records that some of you talk about, but almost 3,000 records is still a lot of updates. So when I talked to our IT department, they were able to put a redirect on the old system. So if somebody finds one of our records in first search and clicks on the link, they get a redirect to our new um, digital commons. And that works really, really well. But um, my concern with that is we, um, can't delete... we are at time. Okay. We can't delete the old system. And that's a concern long term. And perfect. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I want to tell you, you have a lot of fellow catalogers in the chat and on the call. So you're you're in good company. Uh, well, that's good to know, because I was a little concerned at one point that I was going to be everyone was going to get the look when you interview catalogers and they talk too much and the public services people go to sleep. That's OK. Nope, not here. And we're going to keep you on the spot because you have a second one. Yes. And um, uh, I thank you for being willing to put these together because um, this information that we're talking about, a stable ID as an anchor, is something that came out of my work in transferring the data. And as I said, we migrated and we used the locally um number to be able to sync things and it would have been a nightmare without that and that old number i was convinced that i wanted to be able to have a number in the metadata because it needs to be in the metadata so it can be downloaded to be able to move forward with the digital commons because i wanted to be prepared for the next time so in conversations with bpress they said to use the manuscript number which i've given you an example up here and another number that they have um, is uh, a number that's obviously coming from their uh, the link to their old system, but you would have to massage to get that out of there. As I was working on creating and updating these new records in the system and testing it, I became concerned because this manuscript number actually behaves more like a record number and it doesn't download in all of the download features that we got from um, B Press. So I was very concerned about that. And, um, you know, I've had experience with proprietary information and I don't want to say that I don't trust it, but you can't always get things that are in pr uh, proprietary numbers out of systems. And I wanted to be able to remove this number if we needed to go forward. So I talked to our digital initiatives librarian and we agreed, um, and you can go to the next slide, to go ahead and put our own number in to the, to the new system. And um, from the system that in our BPRESS system, the old uh, number from our system, old ETD system is called an identifier. And we had an, a, a number created called a ProQuest ID and looking forward, I probably should not have had it named ProQuest ID, but that's what we put it in as. And we made that number the same as the old ED TD numbers. And as we move forward, I am just adding numbers onto that element uh, to be able to continue to have something in the system we can work with. I'm showing you um, an image of how the old number looks in our catalog in the back end and how the new lumber, number works. And why do I think it's so important to have this kind of number in there? And the, per, the first thing is migration. And while we've just migrated and we're not actually looking to migrate anytime soon, um, as librarians, we know that systems migrate all the time. And when we're putting data into our metadata, we're putting data in that will live in systems in some form for decades. We have in library catalogs, um, records that go back decades, and some of the information in our online catalogs came from print catalog cards when we were actually converting into the systems in the 70s. So 
to me, it was really important to be able to have a hook and have a numeric hook. Um, one of the things when I was part of the group that set up the original um, old ETD system and the IT people were like, oh, well, we can match off author or we can match off title or some, um, you know, system of those two. And I was like, no, no, we can't do that. You know, if you work with data, you know that authors and titles are not unique. We already have in our system um, someone who did a master's and a PhD in at the University of Memphis and used the exact same title for both of them. So it looks like a duplicate record, but it's not a duplicate record. We also have a number of titles, which are three essays in finance. And of course, that's not unique. So um, numeric data is unique where authors and titles aren't. And we know going forward, this is going to only grow. I did use URLs in a match point when I was trying to put the uh, manuscript number in, but you don't want to be keeping old links, 856 um, links to your uh, old data data systems in your system. And um, record numbers is again, they may not be, you may not be able to get them out when you go to migrate. So I strongly encourage and and wanted to let people know our experience using a match point and to consider even putting them in manually to keep your data, to be able to be able to move and keep your data synced up with um, your local catalog if you actually put your records in there. And that's basically what I wanted to, wanted to talk about. Fantastic. Thank you so much for both of your presentations. This is really important work that you're doing. And I, I do know, the you know five essays or three essays on ma microeconomics and there's like 10 of them you know it's the same title <laughs> everybody's got yeah so <laughs> so i get it and i appreciate that hard work that you're doing all right thank our you next, our next flash talk is charlie so charlie greenberg take it away all right uh this is gonna be like a petra kucha because i have a number of slides i'll just say next slide and uh if save a little more for some of the other slides. So yes, the um, Journal of Electronic Theses and Dissertations is an open access peer reviewed journal about ETDs. And uh, I happen to be the founding and still current managing editor. And I can say next slide. So, you know, the J journal JETD is sponsored by NDLDT. And the uh, host for our uh, open access journal is the Institutional Repository at the University of the United Arab Emirates. Next slide. So th the journal was actually launched in the spring of 2021, but the planning for the journal goes all the way back to about 2018. And uh, I was part of a committee that was trying to figure this out for a long period of, you know, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? And um, then we came up with the initiative that we really wanted to start it. And so again, Dr. Edward Fox um, is the executive editor and you can see the current list of associate editors, including the executive director of USETDA. Yeah, he knows something about this process. Uh, next slide. Yep. So we do do uh, an honest, uh, careful peer review. And I know this drives authors up the wall because it simply takes too long. Still in our system where we don't have paid staff, but we have a lot of volunteer staff all over the world in different time zones. But it takes a while to get through the system and to give each uh, paper um, uh, two uh, reviews, blinded reviews, and I do the communication with the authors when they when they are understandably cranky because they haven't heard anything in a long time. And uh, yeah, Terry is ready to shoot me. I know she uh, has been one of my um, projects, trying to get it published and then having to revise it, then having to provide the reviews and pinpoint where some improvements can be done. And yeah, I'm not a cat. <laughs> yeah, neither am I. But um, next slide. So we do have, you know, submission evaluation criteria. And uh, 
you can see that we look for organization and clarity, articulated problem, original contribution to the ETD field. Uh, does it include a literature view? Do they clearly have the design and methodology and standard English and established uh, reference style? And you can see there's a sheet in the image to the left where people can actually you know, work up a approximate score when they provide feedback. Next slide. And uh, this is from the author guidelines page. Uh, we have in the author guidelines, very careful um, um, directions for manuscript preparation and a checklist for submissions. And, and it's amazing when things come in and they don't follow <laughs> the guidance, but that's, that's part of the process. So I don't have any sort of staff that's going to sit there and try to improve manuscripts because I'm not a commercial publication. I'm a volunteer managing editor for a nonprofit organization. So next slide, please. This is it. Everybody stare at this. Yeah, this is the form. This is the citation format and paper format. It's kind of um, plain and I know it's not beautiful and we can't yet adopt some sort of uh, software that can make our articles beautiful, but we want to standardize on APA 7th. And the APA website has a link to a model paper that you can always start with. I frequently are sending the link to the model paper to authors to ask them to um, conform. Yes, next slide. Uh, this is uh, the up-to-date uh, kind of global uh, readership for the 11 or so articles that we've published. Um, we we um, have an, a good, absolutely global readership, a high readership in, of course, the United States and also India, where the ETD um, symposium, uh, NDLDT ETD symposium is going to be next month um, in Gujarat in the city of Gand Gandhinagar. Gandhinagar, that's where it's going to be. All right, next slide. Best time. All right, and uh, you can see the titles. You can see these on the journal site. Next slide. And this is our most popular article. Well, popularity is based on a, a metric of how fast does it get read, read, read once it was written. And you can see the staff at Figshare wrote this article. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. And I think, you know, John has a, a thing in the chat we can circle back to in a little bit, but I think there's some really interesting discussions that we've had today that and yesterday that could potentially become articles um, for Charlie to take a look at and be published. So um, be in touch with Charlie or John if you have questions. And we'll move on now to Kristen, who's going to talk about AI. Um, is this, did you get my slide? Yep. This is your title slide. So oh, once can you, you start go talking, to the, I'll flip. Yep. Can you go to the main slide? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I am really excited about artificial intelligence and specifically generative artificial intelligence. I think this is going to help us um, because I, I have a I have a feeling that the ability to use plain language to speak to computers is going to make our students' lives easier when they're trying to format their electronic thesis and dissertations. So the tool that I'm talking about is called Copilot. Um, it's being developed by Microsoft and it's actually not developed yet. And I haven't really used it yet. So I'm totally imagining what the future might be. Um, but what it what they say about their Copilot is that it's a suite of assistive tools integrated into Microsoft applications. Um, and it's going to be essentially just like the help menu or like if anybody remembers Clippy from the old Microsoft Word, um, it's going to be something that is sort of within the interface, but not necessarily that intrusive. Um, but I believe that it's something where you can interact with it using natural language. And so my idea, and this is what I hope it's going to be able to do and something that you can start imagining, like how might I use a generative AI that I can speak to with natural language 
in my work as an electronic thesis dissertation administrator, some ideas that I have are, for example, um, if, if you have a user who's typing their thesis into a Microsoft Word document and they're like manually applying bold format to the text that they want to appear to be a heading, my hope is that the Microsoft Copilot will be able to say to them, hey, is this a heading? Would you like to use a heading style? Um, and so then instead of having to educate this user about things like heading styles, um, digital accessibility, making an interactive outline for your PDF, that Microsoft Word is going to be like already anticipating this need on behalf of the user and they'll be able to make helpful suggestions in that way. I also have this hype, have this fantasy that you'll be able to like as a reviewer tell Microsoft Word, um, hey Microsoft Word, this is the list of format requirements that I want to check this Microsoft Word document and that the co-pilot will be able to look through your requirement list and then look at the document and, and sort of magically say, yeah, um, I do see there's an orphaned heading on page 68, um, or it looks like maybe there's a chapter missing, or, you know, those things that we see because we're meticulously scrolling carefully through every individual thesis or dissertation. My hope is that Microsoft Copilot could um, make that a little bit faster by understanding what the requirements are and then searching through that um, target document on our behalf. And then, of course, I believe that it will be a, a immensely valuable tool for enhancing digital accessibility features in a document. Um, the generative AI technologies are one of the scariest and most incredible abilities they have is knowing what pictures depict. And so even though right now the automatically generated alt text for figures in Microsoft Word is notoriously inadequate. My hope is that once they get Copilot going and integrated into the system, it's actually going to be quite good, potentially to the tune of, you know, that being sufficient in and of itself, such that, you know, if a writer or, or author does want to add their own alt text, it would only be to improve the existing alt text and not to make it minimally sufficient. So those are some ideas that I have about what Copilot is going to do. Like I said, I haven't actually had a chance to try it yet. Um, and I don't think anybody has with Microsoft Word, but the Copilot technology is actively um, in place in Microsoft PowerPoint. So if any of you use PowerPoint to make your slide, you can now open up in PowerPoint this um, feature called Designer, and it'll open up a panel on your PowerPoint interface and it'll say like, you know, do you want your slide to look like this? I personally am not that good at designing slides, but um, PowerPoint Designer, um, use, I used it to make this slide and I think it's rather nice and it, was effortless because I simply clicked a button and it said, okay, here's a really beautiful circuit board. And, and then it moved over my bullet list and formatted it all. And I think, you know, a pretty pleasing way, um, considering that I put zero effort into it. So these are the kinds of, um, things that, that you can keep your eye out for. And if you're like, not sure if AI is going to impact you, this is, you know, potentially an exciting way that it could make your life better and easier. So um, we are at time. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Kristen. All right, our next presenter is Beruz. Uh, okay, yes, hello. Thank you, Emily. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. And I should uh, thank you as uh, ETDA for this opportunity to learn from you all and uh, share my flash talk about the values of the national EDD programs. I'm a faculty in Iran Doc, an organization which is uh, collecting and disseminating EDDs across Iran. Uh, well, there are different types of EDD program, programs at uh, an institutional level, at a national level, at a regional level, and at the global level. While there are many, many institutional ETD programs around the world, 
the number of national ED programs is very limited, uh, maybe because of uh, resource allocation, cultural factors, legal consideration, and technical infrastructure challenges. Well, uh, some countries have uh, established their uh, NETDDs, uh, let's say NETs, uh, including the UK, British Library, uh, British Library Ethos, Canada, Thesis Canada, Brazil, B, uh, D, TD, uh, well, uh, Taiwan, um, Turkey, uh, Lithuania, South Africa, and India, Italy, and uh, Iran. Well, uh, there are different models uh, of national programs. Uh, some of them uh, directly collect the ETDs them themselves and disseminate their full text, like Shodganga in India, while others uh, prefer to harvest uh, these works from institutional repositories. Well, uh, participation in some of uh, these programs is uh, mandatory, like uh, Test Mercury in Turkey, but others uh, do not compel institutions to participate, like uh, ETHOS in the UK. Uh, some only gather metadata, like EDD portal in uh, South Africa, while others uh, collect the full text, like uh, Thesis Canada. Uh, but why uh, NETDs, uh, NETD programs are important? What are uh, their values? Certainly, uh, NETS programs uh, offer several unique and uh, significant benefits that uh, make them important in the realm of, uh, realm of uh, academia and research. One of these benefits is enhanced uh, accessibility. Well, do you have my voice and my video. Emily, do you have? Yes, I can hear you, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, okay, uh, well, one of these benefits is uh, enhanced accessibility. NETS programs make research more accessible to a wider audience by providing a, a centralized repository for EDDs, uh, they ensure that research findings are uh, readily available to scholars, students, and the uh, even general public. Another value is uh, increased visibility. It, it is hosted in, a national, uh, in national programs, perceive a greater visibility. Uh, this uh, exposure can uh, lead to increased citations and uh, recognition for scholars which is especially valuable for early career researchers. It also benefits institutions by showcasing their research output and, uh, and uh, on a national or uh, institutional stage. Uh, NET programs contribute to the preservation of academic uh, heritage in a country. They ensure that uh, the intellectual contributions of graduate students are achieved, uh, archived and uh, maintained uh, in a secure digital format. Furthermore, NETS program provide valuable data for research evaluation and impact assessment. Bibliometric analysis, uh, citation counts, and download statistics can be used to measure the influence and reach of academic work. Uh, this data is uh, uh, instrumental in making informed decisions regarding funding, promotions, and research policies. Uh, well, NETS programs align with the uh, principles of open science. They uh, promote transparency, collaboration, and uh, the free exchange of knowledge by offering, uh, well, as unrestricted access to research. They contribute to the uh, acceleration of scientific discovery and innovation. Indeed, uh, academic integrity in, uh, is another significant benefit of uh, NET programs. NET programs often incorporate uh, plagiarism detection tools and uh, systems or can be used as a significant corpus for in order to support other plagiarism detection tools. Okay, we, well, we are at time. Okay, another uh, value is cost saving. Another value is enhancing uh, employment uh, opportunities, uh, inform policy making, and uh, decreasing research duplication uh, are among the most important values of NETS program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. All right.
We've got our next talk, which is from Ruth Liu. Take it away, Ruth. Thank you, Emily. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ruth, and I am the Director for Thesis and Dissertation Services here at Ohio University. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a dissertation writing retreat as uh, programming uh, at Ohio University. So dissertation writing has always been experienced as arduous, iterative, and uh, very complex. So in order to better facilitate such efforts and create a more supportive campus writing culture, Ohio University has has continuously improved program uh, programming to further graduate students' scholarship development. So this writing retreat, form formerly known as uh, Writing Boot Camp, has been one of the signature programs that has been run successfully and received positive uh, feedback from students from all disciplines. Uh, now it is a joint effort among the Graduate College, the Academic Achievement Center, and the University Libraries. So in order to mindfully design an intentional workshop, uh, we had a few learning goals in mind. Uh, so these are the three uh, big ones that we want students to take away. Uh, first is to provide students with a nice uh, opportunity to improve their dissertation writing skills. This includes refining research methodologies, strengthening argumentation, time management, and also enhancing their clarity and coherence of their writing. And second is uh, fostering collaboration. Uh, we want uh, very informal uh, platforms for students to connect with each other. And, and sometimes during the writing process, they would exchange their WhatsApp number or um, set up meetings after the writing retreat to meet individually. And we would like to uh, for those synergy to, to foster around campus. And I also think yesterday learning from Kristen and Lily and um, a, a lot of other present, uh, presenters, uh, I think uh, setting up a Canvas learning mo module would be a great idea to implement in the future. And uh, third is to send, uh, setting and meeting uh, milestones, um, things like candidacy and those um, the 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 period after candidacy. How can you keep the students motivated um, after this uh, period um, is uh, pretty cr crucial. So next slide, please. So here is the overview of uh, this specific program. It is a two day dissertation writing retreat uh, designed to. Pro provide students uh, with focused time and a supportive resourceful environment to work towards uh, their uh, dissertation. So uh, we have quiet writing time on each day for four hours. Um, and in a separate room, uh, we have a, a, a resource fair and um, some other act activities such as uh, consultation and panel discussion from students who have done dissertation um, and or are going through the process so they can know in, uh, firsthand how this experience is like and can commiserate uh, as well with uh, other peers. And uh, we also set up a three-step uh, program assessment um, pre-registration uh, when we collect students' info. Uh, after the program, we do a focus group. And then um, after the event, we'll do a follow-up survey so that we know uh, how to improve uh, this overall experience. So, um, and also this is a hybrid programming. So we have in-person portion and also uh, the online version. So there will be a tutor or facilitator to answer students' questions um, uh, during, in these uh, writing spaces. So um, in consideration of time, so thank you for listening. Uh, and uh, I would love to hear if you have any suggestions or feedback. And I will turn it over to John for the last presenter. As Thanks, Ruth. I know we'll get back to you in a bit with some questions. And we are on to our last flash talk. That is Mr. John Hagen. John, take it away. Thank you so much, Emily, and everyone for participating. I see we have about 60% of our registered attendees in this session, so that's good to know. Um, could you pop to the next slide, please? Um, Yes. So um, we're going to talk about um, resources. And I see my arrows are missing on the slide here. Um, but the, oh, there we go. You've got them clickable. Um, so community um, at the, actually at the top of each web page on the US ETDA website, um, there are some prime links. And those, it's probably the easiest way to navigate um, to find the information you need um, very quickly. So um, community resources. 
Um, we have a variety of web pages we've talked about earlier in this um, conference, the Community Engagement Group, ETD Format and Users Group. We have the US ETDA Forum, which is on um, Google Groups. And so anybody can put questions out there for the entire list and so forth. Um, we have regional representatives uh, for the U.S. and other regions in the world. And we're in the process of um, developing that. And we'd really like to have your participation in, in that process. There are options to volunteer. For example, if you're interested in serving on the U.S. ATDA Board of Directors, we have an application. And we always welcome fresh faces and new perspectives. Um, and then I've added some other links recently um, that are quite related to our community resources. Um, so we have our conferences archive. You can look up information about our um, uh, past conferences. We have an events calendar. And actually on the um, upper left of each uh, corner of each web page, um, there is the um, current events that are going on. Um, and so you can always click into that. And it's where you purchase tickets for the registration. I mean, registration tickets for the annual conferences and so forth. Um, and uh, oh, so we have you know USDA a members list. I think it's on the next slide. Um, membership enrollment options and so forth. Um, and then next slide from the membership um, web page, um, we have new three basic options now. We formalized our membership processes, um, so everybody can get in the door um, with a free associate membership that gives you basic access to all of our resources. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about some of our resources that are locked, but you just need to log in. So you just need to sign up and then you can get an occasional newsletter for us and stay um, uh, in touch. Um, we have our institutional membership, which is really valuable, particularly for folks who have multiple people at your institution who would like to attend the conference. We offer a discount for unlimited number of staff at your institution. It's only $100 per year, and that certainly helps to sustain our nonprofit organization. And, and then we have an individual membership as well for um, uh, smaller programs and special circumstances. Um, next slide, please. So um, I... I'm going to skip out on the demo, but you can certainly um, visit this online. Our US ETD members page um, has a listing for everyone who signs up under an institutional and enrolls under the institutional or individual membership plans. Um, that primary contact at your institution will show up there. And um, when you go to register, that's where you can check to see if your institution is, you know, um, uh, is a formal member or not. Um, the next slide. And then we have access to, you have to log in to access this, um, but we have uh, the member contact information. And then if you log in and then click the next slide, um, you'll actually be able to see the entire list of all of our members, the associate members, institutional and individual members, along with their email address. And so we really would like to encourage you all um, to find who your peers are. Um, and then one other aspect of this in the search protocol, um, there are you can search by last name, organizational affiliation, um, or type of organization. And if anybody who's gone through our membership registration process, um, there is a fixed field for libraries, graduate school, and I think information technology and other. So you can quickly bring up a list of you know, people you want to see that are only in libraries or only in grad school, et cetera. Um, so we think it's pretty handy and really helpful. And we hope that you will utilize that to network with each other all year long. Uh, what's our next slide here, Emily? Um, so then the other prime resource is uh, resources for ETD professionals. And as I mentioned earlier, some of these resources we've left wide open, for example, ETD terms and definitions, things that are fairly common and, you know, we don't want people to have to dig. But some of the other resources we find are, you know, somewhat precious and we want to reserve them for, our, um, you know, engaged community. And again, you just need to get either an associate or you know, individual or institutional membership and you can log in and have access to all of that information um, that is there. Um, I've recently updated the accessibility resources from the workshop yesterday, and so we have a lot of new links and information. Um, Emily, next slide. Quick pitch for next year. We hope you will join us either in person or online in Provo, Utah, um, for our US ETDA 24 conference um, to be hosted at the um, Brigham Young University campus. And uh, so we're really excited um, and gearing up toward that. And then the next slide. Uh, we would implore you to, if you're interested and you want to host, uh, help host a conference, US ETDA conference um, in a city near you, um, to let us know. I think we've set January 1st, 2024 as the initial deadline um, for bids. US ETDA handles all the financials and everything. We just are looking for local host support um, and logistics and that kind of thing. So um, please um, engage yourselves with our resources. And uh, thank you very much, Emily. Yay, we did it. Okay. Thank you all for
presenting. Um, and I want to turn it over now to Terry, see if we have any questions that um, we can share. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I put everything onto a Word document. I did not have Clippy to help me. I've highlighted the actual questions instead of the comments. So uh, first question, a uh, true question, uh, came from John um, to Charlie's presentation. Um, specifically, could you elaborate on the types of publications that JETD accepts? Uh, we accept uh, good research or the research design. We also accept commentaries. We would also accept a carefully done review of a particular online resource. It pretty uh, much is laid out in the uh, instructions to author the types of ways that they can um, write to support the journal. Fairly, okay. but that include like a write up of conference highlights of or our conference, for example. Mm, why did I? Yeah, you see, I'm kind of hedging. Um, I, I saw in your description uh, <laughs> of materials that that seemed valid, but I thought I'd ask because we'd like to. I, I do think that. the uh, you know we have a global we we have we have been attempting to publish a global perspective on ETDs for a particular year. And I think a national perspective on ETDs for a particular year is like a commentary. So yes, that's true. Now, in terms of uh, uh, the account of a conference, I don't know. I'm I'm sort of hedging. I have two minds about this. They More. used to do like conference reports with I think Horizon was the publication. I've done a few of those, and right. people I just really don't, like to I see just those. Don't, we have a news area of our of a, of our websites so perhaps i think of those conference reports as something more as news not necessarily a scholarship that's my opinion um, i just want to I, I know we're going over so i just want to make sure we address one other question um uh, so from to Ruth from Kristen, I think part of this question was already um, answered in the chat of in terms of how many students participate in the writing retreat. Is it mostly final year students? How do you handle event promotion? Um, and so I don't know that all of those questions were addressed. And the last set of questions are for you, John, um, from um, to clarify on how colleagues would join if they have an institutional membership. So I don't know if um, either one of you want to address it right now or follow up, you know, since we are going a little bit over, I'll leave it yeah. up to you. Bye. <laughs> Just briefly, um, yeah, um, the process for institutional members, um, whoever signs up for the institutional membership will, will then have a link that they can share with others, other colleagues at their institution. And then the other people can then create an account under the umbrella a corporate account basically that's how that works um and then the main person who signs up and pays the bills or whatever their account shows up under the official USATD supporter members and then in the members directory everyone will show up along with their email address to you know be contacted and so forth so does that address the question And thanks, Terry. I think I've answered Kristen's question in the chat. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming to the Community Engagement Group meeting. Again, we'll be meeting next month. Um, topic to be determined, but I'll be sending an email out to anybody who is interested in participating. Um, so just sign up for that, um, sign up for the, the group um, through the link on our website and we'll get you on the list. Um, I believe we have a little bit of a break, right, John? And then we do our closing ceremonies. Um, and our closing ceremonies involve prizes. So please come back uh, for prize time. And we'll see you back here in a, what, like 10 minutes, I think? All right, thank you all.